Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Sumner. I'm here with you from Right on Mission. And as the president of Right on Mission, it is my joy to explain to you that we are doing a series called The Bible in Two Hours. And it all started on Good Friday in 2020 when I taught the entire Bible in two hours. And since then have been following up with the whole book of the Bible in two hours. And today what we're going to do is the book of Habakkuk. It's the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, and I'm not expecting you to know anything about it. Now, sometimes when we do this, I'm giving you lots of biblical history, and we're getting into the larger story of what's happening in Scripture. But today, I'm going to stick in right with the book of Habakkuk, and I want you to go from the point. It's just three little chapters. We're going to go from the point of talking about a lot of particulars of this book. And at the end, we're going to read through the book, and I feel confident that you'll understand it if you can just hang with me through all these prefatory remarks. I have a New American Standard Bible with me that I'll be going through. Whatever version you have is fine. Not all versions have the same goal, but when you go to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, we're going to go through every line of it eventually before this is finished today. This is a very intense time with the election, the results of the election still up in the air, and with a, a lot of questions about the ethics of how the process has gone, and the COVID crisis, and then all the different hardships in your life, and the things that we're going through that are inevitable, the aging process, and the difficulties with trying to get our businesses going and to, you know challenges with raising our kids and our grandkids and getting ourselves through school. There's just a whole lot, isn't there? And the book of Habakkuk wants to talk to us about macro issues of difficulty and then down to our own heart and how we are positioning ourselves before the Lord. So I want to ask you please to join me in prayer and then we'll jump right into the book of Habakkuk. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to go through your word. Thank you for our copies of your word. Thank you for the truth of your word and the perspective giving reset, Lord, of your word. And I pray, my King, that we'll believe you and that we'll trust you. God, please increase our understanding. Help us with our attention, Lord, so we can be attentive to your word. Thank you that we can go slowly. It's been two whole hours just on these three chapters. But on the other hand, Lord, it's a whole book in just two hours. And so I pray for everybody here, Lord, to be able to follow along and comprehend. Help me to make it easy to understand. And then, Lord, we thank you for your brilliance and your justice, your righteousness. And, Lord, it's so daunting. Here we are, mortal beings. And, Lord, I pray on behalf of all of us, Lord, here we are. And Lord, we're presenting ourselves to you, our God, our creator, the judge, our redeemer, our hope. And Lord, you know everything we've done. And Lord, we trust your perfect justice, your perfect love. And I pray, my King, that all of us, Lord, will love you more because of the book of Habakkuk and how you've revealed yourself to us in these words. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope everybody has a worksheet. If you don't have a worksheet yet, make sure you get that from Right on Mission. This is a rather short worksheet. Some of them are very long. This one, I didn't type out all the word to the three books, but what I've done instead is made a worksheet for you that gets right into the themes. So if you're like, wow, I've read Habakkuk, I don't understand it, then just remember that right now because I think that in a couple hours, about an hour and a half, roughly something like that, that you might have a little bit different perspective. Okay, so I'm going to be referring to the worksheet a lot. I hope you have a copy of that. I've got my Bible, got the worksheets, and let's take a look at this. I've got letter A, letter B. We're all talking about the clarity and the expectation so that I want you to know that what I'm here to do is really help you understand the book of Habakkuk. I may be saying exhortations along the way, but my point is not to give a three-point sermon. So some people are saying, well, you should have preached this better. You should have been more practical and given more application. That's not my goal, okay? The goal is to help you understand the book of Habakkuk. My goal is to help you be able to go back and read it all by yourself with understanding. And for you to understand it well enough that you could actually guide somebody else through it 
if you're going to have lunch with them and talk about the book of Habakkuk. There's probably nothing more that's needed in the church right now than for people to get back into the word of God, because we'll find out when we get to the book of Isaiah that God's word does not go out without accomplishing what God has in mind for it to do. And so we're going to trust that God is going to work in our hearts today through the living word of Habakkuk. Now, you can see here this webinar is an overview. It's a deep dive into the book of Habakkuk. So now I want to just start right here where it says in letter C, it says what Habakkuk is. What is this book of Habakkuk? And it tells us in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1, that it's an oracle. So it's like a pronouncement. You can see here it's a vision. This is a vision that Habakkuk, the prophet of God, he's a real person, okay? He's a Jewish prophet, and he got a word from God in the form of a vision. And we're going to see that word again, the word vision. It's an oracle of pronouncement, and it came at a time to the people of Israel, but it was preserved all these centuries so that it has application for us today. Now, it tells the same story. It's still in the same context, but the marvel of God's word is that it applies in every macro situation in the world and world history. If you look in chapter 3, verse 19, you also find out that really it's a song. Habakkuk is a, an oracle. It's a vision. It's a song. And if we just look at the actual words of it, it's a conversation. It's a conversation between Habakkuk and God. And it's very confusing if you don't know that, if you haven't been taught, because it seems like it switches. And there's like, you know, you read some verses, and then you kind of feel like there's a jolting experience in reading it. Like, wait, who's even talking? And that's because it's going back and forth without giving a play. Like, it doesn't say, God said, and then Habakkuk said. It's not delineated in that kind of a straightforward manner. But once you see what's happening, then it makes sense. And now, remember, when I'm saying this, I'm talking after having studied people who have studied these scriptures for centuries to where you've got a lot of familiarity in how Jewish literature is written and scholars taking careful looks at this over time and comparing their notes to each other, okay? So when we talk about it switching from God to Habakkuk, that's not something quirky that I'm saying. It's something that's been seen in the tradition for a long time, and you'll be able to notice it too today. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now, in your notes I have, there's no red print because in the New Testament, it'll have what Jesus says will often be put in red font, like red print, and so you can tell when Jesus is talking. Well, in the Old Testament here in the book of Habakkuk, it doesn't have red print when God is talking, but I want us to go through this slowly. And again, I want to assure you, if you're like, wait, wait, I'm lost. I don't know anything about Habakkuk. Let me just say again, what I'm giving you right now are prefatory remarks. We're saying Habakkuk is an oracle. It's a song. It's a conversation. It's a vision. And when we go through this and look at some themes at the beginning and go through it chapter by chapter and what I'm pointing out, then our goal today is going to be I'm going to read the whole thing. We'll read it together at the end, three chapters and my prayer is that you're going to be able to understand this, and it's going to just all be like color, motion, picture for you. So let's take a look in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1, and it says, The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. Now, isn't that interesting? It seems like it would say the oracle that he said. It, it seems like it would say the oracle that he heard. But it says it's the oracle that he saw. Now, that already hints that it's a vision because he saw an oracle, which would be content, which would be like conceptual material. It would be actual communicative of some kind of message. Okay? And so now let's look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. So it says, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. So what we have here is in chapter 1, verse 1, there's a narrative, like a narrator saying, what this is, is an oracle of Habakkuk. And when we read through, it starts out in verse 2, 3, and 4 with Habakkuk speaking, saying, how long, O Lord? And in verse 5, there's a jolt of saying, look, be astonished, wonder, 
and, and what I'm pointing out to you is in verse 5, it switches to God. Okay? So we're saying it starts out with the narrator. Verse 2, it's Habakkuk speaking, saying, How long, O Lord, will I call for help? And we're going to go through it in more detail, but I'm just alerting you. In verse 5, it's going to switch to God speaking. Now let's look in verse 12. And it says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? Well, that sounds like it's not God speaking. And that's Habakkuk speaking again. So if you want to put in your Bible, you can say chapter 1, verse 1 is like a narrator. Then 2, 3, and 4 is Habakkuk. Then when you get to verse 5, it's God speaking. Then when you get to verse 12, it goes back to Habakkuk speaking. And it makes it easier to understand when you see these switches. Now we're going to go to chapter 2, verse 2. Then Habakkuk says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it in, on tablets that the one who reads it may run. So now that's God speaking again to Habakkuk. So when you understand who's doing the talking, you can follow along with the meaning. Now notice he said, Record the vision. Now, this is in the days when you don't have video. And that kind of sounds like the oracle Habakkuk saw. He saw an oracle, which is like a vision. And then it says in chapter 2, verse 2, record the vision. When you go to Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1, it says, now this is a prayer of Habakkuk. So the book is going to progress to Habakkuk praying a prayer when he hears what God says. Because in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2, God is going to give him a vision. And so when people come to the scriptures, you may have a lot of elaborate understanding of the history of Israel. And you understand who Habakkuk was a prophet assigned to. And you get all of this understanding. Well, we're coming at this like saying, what happens if you're just reading the book of Habakkuk? Well, we'll get into some of the history of this because it's going to seem sort of parallel, I believe, to what's happening in the United States right now. Because in Habakkuk chapter 1, Israel is being attacked, okay? And this is really southern Israel being attacked uh, by these Chaldeans. And it's a foreign army. It's a foreign force coming in. And Habakkuk is extremely concerned about the sovereignty of the people about he's concerned where is the sovereignty of God he's concerned what's happening there's such treachery going on so in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 2 he's saying Lord how long is this happening so let me just orient you Habakkuk it's a prophetic book a minor prophet of Israel and with great concern about the national welfare of the people and I wanted to do this on November 4th, whether or not we know who won the election, because Habakkuk is a book of consolation and truth. It's a wake-up call to reality of what can happen and what has happened in history, and I want us to see this in the light of the moment we're in now. So I'm on your worksheet, page one, where it says, what's the story What's going on in this Old Testament book? You see how I have that? So basically what's happening is Habakkuk is coming to God, and he's saying, God, why is this happening? Like, what's going on, Lord? Terrible things are happening, and it seems like you're not doing anything about it. Why are you delaying? Look at your worksheet. It says, help. Why aren't you? Why, why aren't you doing something, God? And why are you doing what you're doing? I don't see why you're not doing. It seems like you're not doing what you should be doing. And it seems like you are doing what we don't want you to do. And a lot of people can come to God and pray going, Lord, why aren't you stopping this from happening in my life? And why aren't you helping me more? That's the prayer of Habakkuk coming from a very historically nuanced situation where there's treachery in the land. And we're going to see that God is 
utterly and completely righteous, even though the people aren't. Let's look on your worksheet. The story is this, Habakkuk saying, help, why aren't you? And why are you? And then God saying, oh, I'm here. Habakkuk, I'm here. And I'm doing something that is so marvelous, you would not even believe it if I told you what I'm doing. That's what God tells him. He says, and I want you to record this vision. It's not like I'm not on it. And just because I'm allowing this doesn't mean that I don't have a plan that far exceeds anything that anybody would ever think of. So the book of Habakkuk is daunting and comforting all at the same time. So look at the bottom of page one on your worksheet. And now this is my Texas language. It's like, oh, my stars. And Habakkuk going, wow, like kind of like he's blown away. Didn't expect that. Okay. In a good way. And in a, and in a very indicting way. Because when you're dealing with God, God acts like God. Because that's how God is. Let's go now to page two. And when you see at the top of this, what Habakkuk says is, I heard. I heard from God and my inward parts trembled. Okay? So it's a complaint. It's a prophet coming and saying, help, Lord. Why aren't you helping? Why are things going this way? Why are you doing what you're doing? And God going, I'm here. I'm doing something so wonderful you wouldn't even believe. And I want you to record the vision. And then Habakkuk is like, oh, my goodness. And then Habakkuk backs up and he goes, okay, I heard. And it's like he's quieted. If you can imagine, he's like a clamoring child who's then just sat back and just quieted. Or almost like a screaming babe who then it just falls asleep on its mother's chest and just goes, okay. So in other words, if we had music, if this was a movie, Habakkuk would start out with loud music that's got a little bit of cacophony in it, just hard sounds, and just going, oh, it's brusque, and it's, it's difficult to hear, it's piercing, and part of it's shrill, and it's just overwhelming. And then God sweeps in, and the music changes. And when God is comforting, saying, I'm doing something, the music is starting to assure us. And then the music surges and goes, I'm doing something great, something so great, something so great. And then the music ends up being featuring Habakkuk going, wow. And then there's the shuddering. And you can almost hear like the music starting to go quieter, but with a crescendo and some kind of shaking, you know, of symbolizing Habakkuk shaking and going, I I'm trembled because I am a mere mortal and this is God. And God is God and God can do what God wants to do. And what God is doing is righteous. And then the book ends with like, it would be some kind of, if it was musical, I envisage it, and I can hear it in my mind, being something where the music itself resolves. The chords resolve, and it ends on the goodness of God, on how God himself is completely trustworthy, even though things are not as how we would like them to be. And we trust God, and we honor God, and we respect God. Because the way that the story goes is right. It is right. And the music would have a resolve to go, we end on this correct note. And that's how it goes. So now let's look on letter E, page two. There are four motifs I'd like to point out for you in this book, knowing that you don't know very much about it yet, possibly, okay? So if we say, Letter E, four motifs. One of them is this whole notion of seeing. Now, remember Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. It's the oracle that he saw. Now, let's go to verse 3. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Why do you make me see iniquity? Now, notice Habakkuk is having to look at this. Now, we might see this in, in strikes of Antifa. You've seen damage happening with riots in the United States, which is not the norm for our national history. You see the ravages of COVID. And that's not what's going on here in Habakkuk, but it does make it easy to relate to. 
So Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 3, he's asking God, why do you make me see iniquity? And of course, iniquity is like sin. And then he says, and why do you make me look on wickedness? Like, why do I have to see this with my eyes? When you see iniquity and, and wickedness, it's ugly, isn't it? It's a visual, ugly picture. So now this is, he's saying, there's an oracle which he saw. And now we haven't gotten to the oracle yet. Remember, he's going to say, record that, record the vision, record that oracle in chapter two. But in chapter one, it's Habakkuk saying, this is what I saw. And I'm asking God, why are you making me see this? Now, let's look in, in verse five. Now, isn't this interesting? Right when Habakkuk says in verse three, why are you making me look at iniquity? Why do I have to look at this wickedness? What does God tell him? He says, look. It is like Habakkuk going, Lord, I'm complaining because I'm looking. And then God says, look. It's almost like Habakkuk says, here's what I'm looking at. And God says, you need to look at it differently. Look at what I want you to look at. And you've got to shift your eyes. So there's this whole motif of seeing. Let's look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. Look among the nations. Instead of just looking at this iniquity, you're looking at, like, look up. Look among the nations. Look globally. Observe. I want you to take a bigger look around. Because what God is doing, he's addressing the situation more pervasively than just your own local situation, even though he's addressing your local situation as well. But God's addressing the micro and the macro situation. So Habakkuk says, why do you make me look? And God says, look, observe. Now, when we go to chapter one, verse six, God says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. Now, if you can imagine this, again, I use the analogy of a movie. Can you imagine people coming in? God's raising up these people. They're fierce, they're impetuous, and they're marching through. And there's, there's kind of like a visual of them invading and seizing places that are not theirs. Now, let's go to verse 13. And it says, Habakkuk is saying to God, God, your eyes, and of course the eye is the instrument with which you see, it's the vehicle in your body with which you see. We're talking about a motif of seeing. And he says, God, your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You can't look on wickedness with favor. So let's compare this. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 3, like, Lord, why do you cause me to look on iniquity, on wickedness? And then God says, look, observe. And then in verse 13, Habakkuk says, oh, Lord, you can't look on wickedness. I mean, I'm looking on wickedness and I don't like it. But, but your eyes are so pure, you don't look on wickedness. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't see. Of course, God can see. He sees the motives of our heart. He sees everything. But the point being that God doesn't look on it with favor. This is not the character of our God. His eyes are so pure, he doesn't approve evil. And now look in this, verse 13, he says, Lord, your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you can't look on wickedness with favor. Why are you looking on this with favor? It looks like you're doing what you don't do, God. It looks like you're allowing this. It looks like you like it. It looks like you're approving the thing that I know you don't approve. So, Lord, if your eyes are too pure to approve wickedness, what these Chaldeans are doing is so wicked and it seems like you're looking on them with favor. So can you, again, you can see this oracle is really a complaint. Now, let's, I'm looking at your sheet again, chapter 2, verse 1. And Habakkuk says, I will stand on my guard post. I'm going to station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see. I'm going to watch so I can see. Now, again, we've got this interplay between seeing and hearing. He goes, I'm going to watch and I'm going to see what I will hear. And it, it seems like he's like, I'm going to get on my rampart and I'm going to watch and see what I will see. But he says, I'm going to keep watch to see what God will speak to me. Now, notice Habakkuk has faith that God is going to speak to him. He's in a conversation with God. Now, this is a big subliminal message that we're getting where the, the book doesn't say, 
This is the book of Habakkuk, and this is a book to teach you that God enters into conversations with people. It doesn't explicitly say that, but we actually see the conversation happening. And in this conversation, there's a motif of seeing, and it's striking. Now, and, 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 and where did I get this? I, I reread Habakkuk and wrote up a worksheet for you and showed you what I see as a Bible reader myself, and I'm struck by this. So I didn't pull this out of a commentary. It's something that I personally see. And what happens is when you read the Bible, you can look at your own observations. Now, do you see the play on words I'm saying right now? I'm talking about what I see and what you observe, and we're talking about a motif of seeing. And I'm repeating myself because I want you at the end of this to know the book of Habakkuk and go, oh yeah, in chapter one, it's the oracle that Habakkuk saw, and him saying, Lord, why do you make me look upon iniquity? Why do I have to watch this wickedness? And then God saying, look, observe, look what I'm doing. And then you get this picture of these Chaldeans coming in, and then Habakkuk saying in verse 13, Lord, you're too pure to look at this kind of iniquity. You don't approve this evil. Why are you, why are you looking on this with favor? Then at the very beginning of chapter two, Habakkuk says, okay, I'm going to go up and I'm going to watch. I'm going to use my eyes and I'm going to watch and see what the Lord will say to me. And in verse two, he says, then the Lord answered me and said, record the vision. So now we see the same theme of vision, seeing. And of course, vision has to do with seeing. So he's saying, record the vision. All right, now I'm looking on your sheet again. Do you see where I'm following? What talks about this whole theme of seeing? Chapter two, verse three, he says vision again. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. We've got that seeing word of vision again in Habakkuk chapter two, verse three. The vision is for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal. And we'll talk about that more. Now, verse 4, it says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Now, the reason why I put that verse in there is because we know that faith is when you go forward without seeing. So, in a way, faith is a seeing word precisely because it connotes the idea of believing without seeing. So, there's an implicit this message of seeing, because when you walk by faith, you believe without seeing. You see without seeing. I'm back at the worksheet again. Chapter 3, verse 7. Now, if I left any of these out, you can go back and fill this in yourself when you read Habakkuk by yourself. But let's look in chapter 3, verse 7. And Habakkuk says, I saw the tents of Kushan under distress. The tent curtains at the land of Midian were trembling. I saw. So again, this is a vision, Habakkuk seeing something. So we have a little short book of the Bible, three chapters. Habakkuk is a vision. It's an oracle. It's a song. It's a conversation. And it's a vision about what he saw. And he doesn't like what he sees. He sees that God wouldn't like what he sees. But since God's allowing it, he's complaining, Lord, why do you act like you're okay with seeing this terrible thing to see? And so what Habakkuk says is, well, you know what? I'm going to go see why God is allowing what it seems like God would not want to see. So I'm going to go stand in the rampart, chapter 2, and I'm going to go watch. And I'm going to see what God will speak to me. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Everybody with me? There's a seeing motif. Second, there's a motif of the word why. Now, I studied this in depth for my dissertation on a biblical theology of godly human anger. That was my dissertation, okay? There's the book of Habakkuk, and I'm talking about something separate right now. I'm talking about my PhD dissertation way back in the 90s on a biblical theology of godly human anger. And when I studied that, the word why came up a lot. Because you can ask the word why as a genuine interrogative of curiosity. And you can say, I wonder why the sky is blue. Why is the sky blue? I'm asking a question that's a sincere question of curiosity so that I can understand this scientific phenomenon. 
another way you can ask why is like going, why is this happening? And it's not a question of, of curiosity. It's actually a complaint. It's an expression of pain. And it's like saying, this is so senseless. Why is this thing that doesn't make sense happening? Like, I'm asking, what is the reason for this unreasonable thing that I know doesn't have a reasonable answer because I'm saying why? Because I'm protesting the irrationality of it. So you see in other places in scripture, you'll see Job, and we'll go through the book of Job someday. But Job was in such pain and he's saying, why was I even born? And he's not asking a question of curiosity going, gosh, you know, I really wonder why I was born. I've sat and thought about that philosophically. Lots of times I've kind of looked looked under this rock and that other. That's not what Job is saying. He's going, I shouldn't have been born. Why is this wrong thing happening? And you see it also in the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah saying, why did this happen to me? I do what God wants me to do. And then I just get punished for it. Why? And of course, ultimately we see this with Jesus hanging on a cross, when Jesus quotes Psalm 22. And he says, Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And again, it's not a point of curiosity. It's like a declaration of why is this painful, grievous thing that shouldn't be happening, why is it happening? So if we look here, And Habakkuk, we're on this second motif, why? Let's look at chapter 1, verse 3. We looked at it before. We're looking at it again. And he's saying, why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. So he's complaining And yet he's asking God for help. And when he says why, he's going, God, it hurts. And I'm vexed because I'm looking for some sense. I want the music to resolve. And the music is playing a wrong note. And I don't like it. In chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, you see again this word why. Habakkuk says, Lord, your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you can't look on wickedness with favor. Why are you looking on wickedness with favor? Why are you looking with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallowed up those more righteous than they? So, Lord, I don't see why is what he's saying, and I'm complaining why. You're a God of justice, and this terrible injustice is happening. So I'm coming to you with my why. Now, listen, Habakkuk is modeling to us what to do. When you have a why in your life, why did my baby die? Why did somebody leave right when we were trying to help them? Why did this person come and destroy the thing when it actually even hurt the person who destroyed it? Why is this unnecessary, irrational, wrong stuff happening? And Habakkuk is modeling for us, go to God with your hard why. That's what we see modeled. He's a prophet. He's a righteous prophet. And when you're going there with the grit, with your teeth grinding, with your stomach churning, when you're overwhelmed, and it's a complaint. Now, this is not rebellion against God saying, God, you shouldn't be God. He's just saying, it doesn't make sense. In verse 14, he says, why have you made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them? Lord, there's so many people, and it's like there's just tons of us, and where's the organization? It's like the the chaotic Disorganization is itself a pain. It's a grievance. It's a vexation. Let's look again. Now, I have here that Habakkuk, let's look at it. Can you scan through chapters 2 and 3? Does he say why? 
Can you scan through? Do you see the word why again in chapter two, chapter three? If you scan through, it's not prominent, is it? You'll have to look and see. Does it say why? Well, that's interesting. The why motif is in chapter one. And remember, I told you the way Habakkuk builds up, it's this loud, cacophonous music. And then Habakkuk sitting back going, oh, my stars. God telling him, I am doing something. And then Habakkuk shakes, and then the music resolves. So that crunch, that why, and that is representative of what it's like to pray, to writhe in pain before your God, your maker. I have been praying long bouts of prayer my whole life. I was one of these little kids who met God early. I, I remember being a little girl praying to God all by myself, no grown-ups guiding me. I just prayed to God. And I grew up and learned how to pray. And I pray on my knees. And I recommend that you pray on your knees. And I have a habit now. I'm so thankful I'm back in the habit. In the, in the morning when I get up, I get on my knees physically. And not everybody has the knees to do it. But if you can, if you can't get on your knees, I vote get on your belly. I recommend, I exhort you. And spend time praying to God. And, and pour out your whys. And it's like, if you in your mind, you know how you can just have all this like loud, overwhelmed, pain and confusion and then you express that to the Lord and it's just like in the book of Habakkuk and then God he addresses you and now we're going to see that Habakkuk when he does this he's like you know I'm going to watch and see how God reproves me because I'm not innocent when I come to to the Lord before a holy God I'm not innocent and even though I'm saying my why and I have a legitimate complaint and my pain is valid, it exists, it matters, and it matters to God, it doesn't mean that I'm pure like God is. But when I bring myself to the pure one and I express this to him, and it doesn't have to be in some kind of dissertation like Pulitzer Prize winning way, but you just come to God viscerally and you're explaining, sometimes I can't even say what my prayer is. And I'll just say, God, like, uh, that, you know, hold that thing. And that's what I'll tell God. And I'm telling you, this is my testimony. God has comforted me every single time. Sometimes I've come to God and I'm weeping. And I prayed to him weeping, you know, for over an hour, maybe for over two hours. And I stay on my knees until he touches me. And somehow... It's like I go through what Habakkuk went through, and I went, oh, oh, my stars. Oh, and even if I'm trembling, the music resolves. God touches me. He'll touch you. He will. It's just how God is. And I'll tell you, you can read the book of Habakkuk, and you'll see it happen in this book. And it can happen to you vicariously as you read the book. There's no better place to take your why. And listen, if you're saying, yes, but this was senseless, I believe you. Sin is senseless. Sin is irrational. When something that should be so simple is complicated, that's because of sin. Sin complicates things, and things turn into this whole hairball, and then you come and you bring it to God, and God will resolve the music because God will touch you, and God will be God, and we're going to see that in the book of Habakkuk. So now let's go to this third theme, and this third theme is movement. Now, it doesn't mean these are the only themes in it. These are the themes that struck me when I just recently reread the book of Habakkuk. Look at the movement. Now, I already gave you a hint of this in chapter 1, verse 6. When, uh, I, and I, I was remiss when I said chapter 1, verse 6. I should have said the word behold. That's the seeing word there for behold. Like, look at this. Behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Remember, so God says, look. Observe, behold, that's the motif of seeing. But now we're doing the third motif of moving and going, look, behold, I'm raising up these Chaldeans and they march through. Look at that movement. Can you just imagine in your mind 
These Chaldeans, they're impetuous and they're marching throughout the earth and they're seizing dwelling places that are not theirs. They're dreaded and they're feared. And there's movement of these, of these destroyers marching through. In verses 8 and 9, their horses are swifter than lepers. You can imagine them riding their horses, and you can see like the wind blowing the manes of the horses, and then you see the, the horses, imagine the horse's tail blowing in the wind. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. See that movement word, galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly. That's like movement. They fly like an eagle, swooping. You get to see that whoosh, swooping down to devour. There's movement. Uh, here's Habakkuk complaining. He's probably being still. But what he sees, the oracle, the vision, the song, it's a vision that's got, it's like a motion picture. There's movement. If you go to chapter 1, verse 11, then they'll sweep through like the wind, and they'll pass on, but they're going to be held guilty. So now you're starting to get a bit of a story of Habakkuk going, Lord, how long is this going to happen? Why is this happening? Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? And then I want you to pay attention, God, because why are you making me look at this? And then God says, look. Behold, be astonished. I'm raising up this impetuous people, and they're marching through, and, and I want you to know that they're going to swoop through. They're going to come through like eagles, and they're going to seize places. They're going to grab what's not theirs. They're going to be like a tornado. They're going to be like a hurricane. They're going to come pushing down, and as soon as they get finished, then I'm going to get them. He says, they're going to sweep through, chapter 1, verse 11, like the wind. That's why I said a hurricane, a tornado. They're going to sweep through like the wind, and they're going to pass through. But look, verse 11, but they will be held guilty. Whose strength is their God? Their own strength is their God. And God knows. God sees. God says, look. You think I don't see? I do see. And I know there's a motion picture here, and we're looking at all this movement. So we're going to go to chapter 1, verse 15. The Chaldeans, they bring up all these people. You know, they're, they're sweeping through. They're catching these fish. And you can imagine like a fishing rod going in or a net and sweeping up and catching the fish. The people are the fish. Chapter 1, verse 15, the Chaldeans bring all these fish up, all these people up with a hook, and they drag them away with their net. So it's like they're dragging people. If you can imagine thuggery, these Chaldeans are coming in, and the movement of them dragging the nets, dragging and gathering the people together in their fishing net. And therefore, they rejoice, and they're glad because they're bullies, and they're dangerous, and they're treacherous. They're murderous. Now, there's a lot of movement going on here. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 3. Now, what else is moving? In chapter 1, you have the movement of the Chaldeans, this sweeping through this windstorm, this torrent of enemies coming in and stealing and destroying. In chapter 2, the thing that's moving is the vision itself. Habakkuk is a book about a prophet who gets an oracle, a vision. And God says to him in chapter 2, record the vision, and I want to tell you about the vision. The vision itself is moving. Let's look at it. It says, the vision hastens. Chapter 2, verse 3. The vision is yet for the appointed time. And the vision is moving toward that appointed time. And it hastens, doesn't just move, but it's hurrying. It's going, it's like, it's, it wants to go there. It's going fast. It's hurrying to the goal, but it's going to get there right on time. The vision itself is hastening toward the goal. The vision itself is moving. The vision will not fail. God is in charge of the moving vision that will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for the moving vision. Wait for it, for certainly it will come. It will not delay. It seems so long. Now, we're going to have to go back and connect this because in chapter 1, verse 2, Habakkuk is saying, Lord, how long? 
we're going to come to that in a minute. But I'll just tell you already, he's saying in chapter 1, verse 2, how long? And in chapter 2, verse 2, he's saying, I know it seems like it's delaying, but it's not delaying. It's actually hastening. This is a vision on the move. Some people have read C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. And remember, Aslan is on the move. Aslan is a lion, a metaphorical character in these children's books representing Jesus. And that he's on the move. Well, this is what we hear now in Habakkuk. He's not talking about a lion. He's talking about a vision. And the vision is on the move. The vision isn't delaying. It's not just sitting there. It's not stuck. It's actually hastening toward the goal. So now we go to chapter 3, verse 5. This is in the context of the prayer of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is explaining what happens when the Lord's presence comes. In his prayer, at the beginning of his prayer, saying when the Lord's presence comes and is manifest in a way that, that his presence is here with us in a concentrated way, we're like, wow. When that happens, let's look at this. Verse 5, before God goes pestilence and plague comes after him. So it's like this movement of this pestilence and the plague coming after him. We're getting a picture of God's judgment. Habakkuk is a book about judgment. The vision is about judgment, and the judgment sweeps through. And now even again, tacitly, we're understanding the judgment is swift. Remember, they're hordes of faces. They come in swiftly, these Chaldeans. It's like God's judgment comes in, and it's swift. It comes in, and then it leaves. And it's like before God, there's pestilence. After him, there's a plague. And it's not because God has any evil. God is pure. God is completely holy. He's entirely good. He can't sin. He's 100% holy. He's 100% perfect. We're the ones who aren't perfect. And God is a God of justice. Everybody wants justice. We all want the real justice, especially when someone sinned against me. I want justice to be meted out. But now what about when I'm the one who committed the injustice? And God is a God who's going to meet justice everywhere. And he's going to bring judgment to all. Now, when we did the book of Malachi, we found that, oh, yeah, God is a consuming fire. It says that also in the book of Hebrews. And that you're going to be brought. Now, think about the book of Malachi, different book. Everybody with me? I'm not talking about Habakkuk. I'm talking about another book in Malachi. It says you're either going to go into the fire and get refined or you're going to go into the fire and get devoured, consumed. So God is going to judge everybody because God is holy. And the only way for us to be made holy is to be refined. And so this judgment comes in not because God doesn't love us, not because God doesn't love Israel. It's because God is making things right. And because the consequences of our own actions play out because God is a God who goes by God's own character of consistency and righteousness, and truth, and justice, and love. And God can be counted on. And we can't play games with God. You can't trick God. God will not be deceived. God will not be mocked. And you might get away with something for a little while, like these Chaldeans, but it won't last. So now we see in chapter 3, verse 6, we're still talking about the movement. Now look at this. In chapter 3, verse 6, he stood and surveyed the earth. So it's like before God comes pestilence, after him comes plague. And now imagine him standing. And that's like a lack of movement, like standing and surveying the earth. Look at this. He looked. Oh, hey, we didn't put, we didn't put this verse in our seeing motif. Remember I told you I didn't necessarily put all everything in there? You can add this to your motif as he looked and he surveyed. He looked and he startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. Can you see the movement? You can imagine being a little child and having a sandcastle and having your sandcastle collapse, building a cardboard house and having that collapse, you know, getting a deck of cards and building a house and watch it collapse. And now imagine a mountain and just collapses. There's movement. 
that downward movement of the mountain collapsing is movement. It's that movement motif. Now you see in chapter 3, verse 8, did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was thine anger against the rivers? Or was thy wrath against the sea? Look at this movement word that you did ride on your horses, on your chariots of salvation. Can you imagine God riding a horse? Now, this is metaphorical language. Can you imagine God riding a horse like in the sky? A chariot of salvation? There's Okay, now let's compare. The, the Chaldeans are sweeping through Israel and destroying it. And now here's God. They're on, they're on horses, right? Didn't it say that in Habakkuk 1? Imagine the, the Chaldeans are coming in, destroying. They're, they're like a wind. They're sweeping through. They're, they're wishing through on horses through Israel. And now you've got here in chapter 3, God riding the horses, and he's doing salvation. They're doing destruction. He's doing salvation. Chaldeans on a horse destroying, God on a horse saving. Now you're going to get to see more horses and galloping and that kind of thing in the book of the, of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible. But now let's go to chapter 3, verse 10. The mountains saw you. Oh, here's another seeing word. Okay, I, I'm a teacher, right? I'm trying to get you. This is Professor Sarah Sumner trying to get you to want to read the whole book and go, oh, I'm going to go back home and I'm going to read through really carefully and find all those seeing words because we didn't say them all that first time. There's a motif of seeing. Right There's a motif of why, that crunch, and now there's this motif of movement, and we're talking about these horses going through, and now the mountains see you, and they quake, and that's movement. What happens when a mountain quakes? A mountain that quakes is called a volcano, or it could be an earthquake, right? And, it's the, the, and there's earthquakes. There's actually a fault line that runs the biggest fault line in the whole world. Did you know this runs through Israel? So at the end of time, you know, when Christ comes back, and even when Jesus died on the cross, that earthquake, you can do the science and you'll see this. I've studied the science on it. It's a, it's a big fault line that runs all the way down to Madagascar, outside of uh, way south and to the east of Africa. It says, the mountains quake, movement word. There's a downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. So you can see the mountains are quaking. There's water going up. These are big macro swooshes of Movement, nature moving, mountains quaking. Now you go to chapter 3, verse 12. In indignation, indignation, anger, God did march. Oh, God marched through the earth. Remember that in chapter 1? It was the Chaldeans marching through, and now it's God marching through. There's a parallel. It's like, dear God, why are you letting this happen? The Chaldeans are marching through, and God going, I know they're marching through. Habakkuk, I'm marching through too. They're going to march through, and then I'm going to march through. Dear God, don't you see? Look at what's happening. They're riding horses, and they're sweeping through, and God going, I know. I'm going to ride on my horse, and I'm going to sweep through with salvation. There's a reply. God is so on point, replying to Habakkuk's complaint. Let's look in chapter 3, verse 14. Thou didst pierce with your own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed into scatter us. Their exaltation was like those who devoured the oppressed in secret. Imagine when you're piercing with your spears, you can say, wait, 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 where's the movement? When you pierce with a spear, there's a motion of piercing. A pierce doesn't just like happen. You've got to have a thrust of movement. The movement causes the piercing. And I want you to see this motion picture of macro action in the book of Habakkuk. Because we see this in Habakkuk and you see it other places like Zephaniah where they say, God, you're not doing anything. God is just sitting there. God is like not active is the false accusation. That's false. God is active. And God is doing things. And God is doing things in God's time in God's perfect way. And that's why God says in chapter 1, where Habakkuk is saying, God, look at this. Why are you making me look at this? And why are you looking at something in the wrong way? And, and God correcting Habakkuk, saying, Habakkuk, you look. And what I want you to look at is what I, God, am doing. You're looking at the situation, Habakkuk, and I want you to look at what I'm doing. And see, so now we can look and say, Lord, look what's happening in our country. Look what's happening in the world. And God's saying, look. I'm doing something. Can't we look at me? Observe, wonder, be astonished. 
Now listen, isn't that comp? Is that that's? I, th I find this remarkable. God is commanding us to be astonished. When you're astonished, you're astonished at what you see. You're astonished at something that happened. You're surprised. You're, it's it's like you're you're just blown away. You're like, I wasn't expecting that. I I didn't have that thought in my mind before. Astonishment is a form of learning. And when you learn, you see something in your mind, in your heart, with the eyes of your mind, the eyes of your heart that you didn't see before. It's a form of understanding with awe and wonder. Okay, so now the fourth one, the fourth motif is waiting on God in faith. Now we know from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. I'm quoting Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance. When you're assured, you don't have to doubt. When you're assured, you're calm. When you're assured, you have knowledge. You know it. When you're assured, you rest. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And it's the conviction of things not seen. Now, we've been talking about seeing and not seeing. And faith, as I said, is when you, you, you trust God when you don't see physically what you trust that God sees, what God is doing. I like the word conviction in the New Testament, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. But I like to call it convincement. That faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the convincement of things not seen. Like, I'm completely convinced because of God's character. I'm convinced because God said it. I'm convinced because of the creator. I'm convinced because the one who gave me my sense of justice is completely just. I'm convinced because the one who gave me my eyesight can see perfectly. I'm convinced because the one who gave me a voice to complain is the God who can judge without flaw. We're trusting God as God. Okay, so this theme of waiting on God, waiting on God, not just waiting, not just sitting there biting our fingernails and crossing our fingers going, boy, how do I sure hope it goes well, but we're actually waiting on God. I have a question for you. Have you ever waited on God? I imagine you've waited on a phone. Like, I'm waiting for a phone call. You're waiting on that phone to ring. Sometimes you've waited on your loved one. You've waited on your child. You've waited on someone at the doctor's office. But did you ever wait? Did you really? Were you waiting on God? Because there's a theme in the book of Habakkuk where you actually wait on God. One time I got a phone call from my dad. This was when I was in my 20s. And my dad called me up, and he had been learning something. He was a Christian, and he was he, was, he learned something about God. And he called me up, and he said, Sarah, you know what I learned? I said, what's that? And he said, there's only one thing worse than waiting on God. And I said, what's that, Daddy? And he said, not waiting on God. <laughs> you don't want to not wait on God. And it can be so painful to wait on God because it bruises and kind of sucks it to our pride. But if we humble ourselves, waiting on God is the most assuring, comforting thing you can do. Now, all that's my little mini speech on what it means to wait on God. So let's look at the worksheet here. There's a theme in Habakkuk on waiting on God in faith. So if we look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. Now, this is a verse that I just mentioned a little bit, but it's such a key verse for understanding the whole rest of the book. Okay, so y'all with me? Habakkuk chapter one, verse two. This is Habakkuk complaining to God. How long, O oh Lord, will I call for help and you won't hear? I cry out to you. I'm not just crying out, God. I'm crying out to you. I cry out to thee, my Bible says. I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. Now, notice he's waiting on God. 
how long, oh Lord, do I have to wait on you? I'm crying out to you. I'm going to you, God, and I'm still here and you still didn't fix it. You didn't do it yet. But I'm waiting on you. And this is good modeling for us to wait on God and not just have to wait on the government or wait on ourselves, but to wait on the God who is overseeing all of creation, the God who is sovereign over all history, the God who created us and can change anything he wants to change. And yet the God who's given us such dignity that we're created in his image and we're decision makers and that God has given us that extreme dignity to bear his image like that. Okay, now let's look at chapter two, verse three. This is again, this whole theme of waiting. We talked about this already. The vision is yet for the appointed time. Now, isn't that interesting? God has set us free to where we're a whole bunch of billions of decision makers, independently making decisions, I mean, think about it. Almost every decision you make, you didn't confer with anyone before you made that decision. You just did it. And that's the same with me. Now you've got 7 billion of us or 9 billion of us at a time making free decisions, unconsulted decisions. And you've got all these different generations. People, you know, a whole generation lives and they die. You've got all these different decision makers. And even though we have this freedom of decision making at the, at the level that we have it, God still has an appointed time. And all of our free decision making does not change that appointed time. This is God's godness and how God can do this even though we have a measure of freedom. This is one reason why I worship this God, the real God, the only God. The vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal. So there's an appointed time and there's a goal and it sounds like it's fixed. And we can trust that God's holding that in place and that the vision's going right toward that goal that isn't moving. He's got that appointed time that the free decision makers cannot disrupt. We can't make that different. Now, waiting on God in faith, you know, of course, and I don't have this on your worksheet, but maybe we should just look at it because really the big theme verse in this and it gets quoted in the New Testament is Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. And it says, behold, oh, there's another seeing word. Did y'all catch that? You might put that in your seeing. But remember, we've got the theme of seeing chapter two, verse four. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. You don't live by the circumstances. You don't live by complaining that the Chaldeans are sweeping through. You live by faith in the God who has the goal, God who has the appointed time, God who's going to march through, God who's going to ride on the horses in the heavens and, and salvation, on God who's in charge, who's God, that you put your faith in God. This verse, chapter 2, verse 4 as for the proud one, behold, his soul is not right within him. I'll just say it now. You know, I've pondered this verse a lot in my life. And if your soul isn't right within you, I call it scoliosis of the soul. It's like if I were just standing in a mirror and you guys were all just to examine exactly my body, you would see I'm slightly lop-hipped. My, my spine has got a little bit of a scoliosis to where, I mean, I can run far, you know, I'm, I'm healthy and robust, but I don't have a perfectly straight spine. And you know that if your spine is really curved, you know, they call it scoliosis. I probably don't really qualify all the way to scoliosis, but you, you understand that term at the spinal level. And what I'm saying is where the scriptures here say, behold, as for the proud person and women, this includes us too, the the proud man, the proud woman, if you got pride in you, it's almost like your soul has scoliosis, like your spine is curved. Another way to put it is this, like, you know, I have my jacket on and sometimes like you just, you just don't have things straight where it's fitted. It's like your soul isn't fitted inside your body in quite the right way. It's kind of all wrinkled up and crinkled. It's just, it just needs to be sorted out because it's not right in there because it's bent. And when it's bent, it's crooked. And if your soul isn't right in you, it makes you crooked. 
And I'm asking God, help me with my crookedness. Help me, God, my, with the corruption in me, basically with my sinful condition. And, the, and he's saying, seeing word, behold, as for the proud person, your soul isn't right within you. But the righteous person, the righteous person isn't the person who's just sinless. It's the person who lives by faith. And when you live by faith, you're trusting in the righteousness of God. When God, I've got scoliosis of the soul, but you don't have scoliosis of the soul. Dear God, I have crooked ways in me. You're not crooked. You make things straight. Dear God is, is completely pure. As a matter of fact, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, his eyes are too pure to even look on wickedness, says Habakkuk. And yet I'm the one who does the iniquity sometimes. And so we have this, this whole idea of waiting on God, and we're waiting on him in a condition of our pridefulness. And as God is bringing about this vision and saying, wait for it, I'm going to be marching through. I'm going to have this salvation, and he's going to save us so that we don't have that pride inside our hearts. Chapter 3, verse 16, we're talking about this theme of waiting. And remember at the end in chapter 3, it starts out with this prayer. And Habakkuk says, I heard. And look at this. He says, I heard. I heard God. God brought this vision in front of me. I heard and my inward parts trembled. Now, isn't this interesting? Because it was, it was the mountains trembling at the presence of the Lord. And now instead of the, just the mountains trembling, it's Habakkuk trembling. So you see an overlap in the themes. We're supposed to be talking right now about the theme of waiting. And here's Habakkuk, and we're going to see him waiting. And yet the theme of moving, of this quaking, the quaking of the mountains and the trembling of his heart is overlapping with the theme of waiting. He says, I heard and my inward parts trembled at the sound. My lips quivered. There's movement. There's movement. The lips are quivering. You know, I've always had a tender conscience. And when I was a little girl, I would tell on myself. And when you look at my life, most of the time when I've done something, or at least lots of times, I'll end up feeling so convicted. I end up and I tell on myself. And I would go to the foot of my parents' bed, and I would stand there, and I would wait, and I was getting myself mustered up to tell them. And first thing, before I could say a word, my little lip would just start quivering. And my parents would comment on it and go, there goes her little lip. And my lip would quiver, blah, 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 blah. but just quiver, just, it just involuntarily quivered. <laughs> and then I would confess and tell them what I did. And now here's Habakkuk, and it's because he's been in the presence of God. And remember, I was a little girl, and I knew God. So when you get the presence of God, it makes you tremble and you quiver. And he says, I heard in my inward parts trembled at the, at the sound my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones. And in my place, I tremble because I must wait. There's that waiting theme. All this treachery is happening in Israel. It's terrible. It's devastating. It's destructive. It's outrageous. And God is saying, I know. I know that's happening. And I have a vision, and the vision's moving, and you got to trust me, and you got to wait. And Habakkuk's like, oh, I, Habakkuk, I have to wait. And I've got to wait quietly. Because see, when Habakkuk starts out, he's not quiet, remember? This oracle, this vision, this movie of Habakkuk starts out really loud. And now here's Habakkuk going, I must wait quietly. Chapter 3, verse 16, for the day of distress. For the people to arise who will invade us. I have to wait in faith. I don't get to see what God promised, but I got to trust that that vision is on the move and it's hastening towards goal. And God has the appointed time all set, no matter what the free decision makers do and that's what Habakkuk says when the music resolves that is the fourth theme now I have another theme this is letter F and this is the theme of God's sovereignty God's justice God's salvation 
And remember, the whole book, I'm kind of teaching this in circles, okay? So I'm not teaching it one A, B, C, D in a linear thing. We're just going circular. So if you're going, wait, how, wait, am I tracking with you? Yep, I'm going round and round. We're talking about Habakkuk again, the whole book. I'm starting out and saying, there's this whole theme of God's sovereignty and God's justice. And it starts out with Habakkuk complaining, God, there's not justice. How long do I have to look at the wickedness? Wickedness is like the opposite of justice. And yet we have this theme of God's justice. If you look in chapter one, verses five and six, God speaking, and God says, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I, God, am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told, for behold, there's another saying word, for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places, which places which are not theirs. I'm the one doing it. You're like, wait, I thought you were the God of justice and you're raising up the bad guys. Yep, that's what's happening. I'm raising up a bunch of sinners to address the terrible sin that I see in the land. Okay, now let's think about this as a jeweler. Can you make an analogy with me? What does it take to cut a diamond? The only thing you can cut a diamond with is a diamond. A diamond is sharp enough to cut a diamond. When you have a terrible fire, what do you fight fire with? Firefighters, they learn and they set backfires because you fight fire with fire. Now, isn't that interesting? In a way, that's kind of analogous, like a reflection theologically of God fighting sin with other sin. Now, God doesn't do anything evil. Don't misunderstand. And we're commanded, never repay evil with evil. We're not doing that, but it's like God uses one person's sin to offset another person's sin. Let me put it another way. You know how in movies, the dinosaurs will end up eating the other dinosaurs. And that's kind of what you see here is all this sin is happening and God's going to use one person's sin to mitigate somebody else's sin. And to where we all don't sin in the exact same way to where it all just goes to pot, but sin ends up stopping sin. It's kind of like your selfishness crashes into somebody else's selfishness and it undoes it to where it's not just a complete takeover. Let's look at the theme here. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Then they'll sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty. That's God's justice. God's saying, I know what they've done. I'm the one who raised them up and I'm going to be the one to hold them guilty. These Chaldeans, they're going to be held guilty. They whose strength is their God. And if you look in verse 12, now here's Habakkuk speaking. And he says, Our, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? And then Habakkuk says, we will not die. Thou, O Lord, has appointed them to judge. God, The God of justice raised up sweeping destroyers who were anti-Israel. He raised them up to judge Israel. The God of justice did that. Look at this. O Lord, O Rock, you've established them to correct. So we look at our own sin and go, we, we're sinning like crazy, and we just keep sinning. How are we going to stop? So God might bring other sinners to stop us from doing that sin, even though the people who are stopping us are sinning a different sin. And God's going to hold them guilty for the sin they committed that stopped our sin from going on too far. Does that make sense? So you have this whole theme of, God's justice, and it's not how we would expect it, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you can see this again in chapter 1, verse 14. Why have you made people like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them? It's, he's questioning God's justice, like, God, you shouldn't have done that. And this theme of justice of going, God, if you were really just, you wouldn't make people like fish without a ruler. It, it would be more organized. It would be better. There'd be more justice. That's what I'm pointing out here. Now, chapter 2, and of course, God is perfectly just. Chapter 2, we're going back to verse 3 again, which we've seen many times. And he's saying, the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal. It won't fail because God is just. It's going to get there. You can count on it. God is sovereign. He's overseeing. 
the, the journey of the vision when it's going on its way to the goal. Now we're looking at this theme of God's justice, God's salvation, chapter 2, verse 7. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? And those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you'll become plunder for them because you've looted many nations. All the remainders of the people are going to loot you because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. In other words, there's going to be justice financially. Your creditors are coming. You think, oh, I could just be in debt for a long time. I don't have to pay my bills. That's a lesson, isn't it, for the United States? I think the United States has a lot of debt. Think of how many Christian organizations are in terrible debt, and they don't have a plan to pay down their bills. They're planning on being in perpetual decade after decade deep debt. We have a lot of financial sin amongst professing Christians. And now this is not a book to the Christians. It's a book to the Israelites and God being a God of justice. And he doesn't like financial sins. There's going to be justice, God's sovereignty. Verse 8, any kind of exploiting when you looted, when you stole, if you, get, if you looted others, you're going to get looted too. And God just saying, you know what? It's all going to come back around. You don't get away with it. And so much of the, oh, why? is going, how can they get away with this? And God's saying, they're not going to get away with it. They won't. And listen, when you do it, you're not going to get away with it either. So you don't want to be proud. You don't want to have scoliosis of the soul. You want to count on God's righteousness. Chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, we, we just did the book of Ecclesiastes. Remember that? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And people have all their toils and labors. And then it's just like, you, you know, you make, you make $10 million and then you leave it to somebody and they just squander it. Here's saying, look, is it not from the Lord that people toil for fire? It's almost like saying we toil for, for futility. We're just toiling where it just is going to end up getting burned anyway. We work so hard for what? We die anyway. We work so hard for what? It didn't fix the earth. You still have all these problems. Now, you see, the book of Habakkuk is building up that God is the one who saves. Only God is the one who can actually ride through and march through and ride his horse through the salvation and to bring salvation. Salvation can come from God. Everybody else in God saying, look, or this is Habakkuk saying, you know, is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire? Is it not from God to show us that we're not the Savior? Anytime you see that where it says Lord of hosts, it's Yahweh Sava, oh, and it's like an anger word. I saw it a lot when I wrote my dissertation on godly anger. Sava, oh, this is like the God who is the God who fights battles. It's the God with his warring angels, the Lord of hosts, the Lord with his angels. This warring God who makes things right. And see, we so much we want God to get up and do something. When God does something, guess what? He's going to indict it and make it all right. And that means we're going to get indicted too. Everybody who's part of the problem, which is all of us, and some people more to some level more than others at different times. But there's only one Savior, only one pure God. So now we go to chapter 2, verse 16. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. In other words, when you think that you're so great, God's justice is going to prevail. And any kind of haughtiness, self-exaltation is going to be brought down. When you honor yourself, it's false. When you honor yourself as if you're higher than and superior to other people, when you get exalted, you're supposed to be doing good to other people, not just bowing down and having people worship you or you stealing or looting or any of this kind of stuff. So again, you see hints of this whole theme. And really, we could put the whole books of chapter 1, 2, 3. It's all about God's justice. It's all about God's salvation. It's all about God making things right. Chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Look at this. Thou didst, this is Habakkuk talking, right? He had this prayer to God, and he says to God in verse 13, chapter 3, Thou didst go forth for the salvation of thy people. 
for the salvation of thine anointed, thou didst strike the head of the house of evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. Wow. Talk about graphic. To lay him open from thigh to neck, and just like to slice him open. It's almost like, you know, you can see somebody doing that, uh, you know, to an animal when you're cleaning up an animal and you just, you know, or surgery, just slicing them all open. And it's saying that God is doing this. What does it say? For salvation. He's striking the head of the house of evil. God is going to make things right. Evil will not prevail in the long run because of God's justice and God's perfect timing to stop the injustice. So in verse 14, you pierced with his own spears. Remember that piercing, that motion of the piercing? You pierced with your own spears the head of his throngs. You stormed in. Boy, there's a lot of movement, like marching in, and you stormed in. Remember the wind in chapter 1, the wind and the marching? And now you've got the stormed in and to scatter us. Their exultation was like those who devoured the oppressed in secret. Thou didst tread on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. Now, isn't that interesting? It's almost like God can ride horses in the sky, and he can ride horses on the water, like the horses are surfing the great big waves. I mean, this is a picture of majesty and strength. And it's all in contrast to the comparatively less strength of the Chaldeans who were overriding and overwhelming Israel. The Chaldeans seem insurmountable. They seem like they're an unstoppable power, and God's power is so much greater. And you see this again in this whole theme of justice. So let's look. We're on page two of your worksheet. And I want you to see the vocabulary because I want to teach you a word in Hebrew, and it's called ad-ana. Ad-ana. Okay, so you can see it looks like ad-ana. You say ad-ana. Now, if that's mispronounced because I'm not a, a fabulous Hebrew speaker, but I'm just going to say belt it out. When you're teaching this, okay, because I hear Hebrew teachers say things differently. And usually there's more of a guttural sound. But if we go, Adana, and what he's saying is, this is him asking, how long? It's in chapter 1, verse 2. How long, O Lord? Adana. And in chapter 2, verse 6, will not all of these take up a taunt song against him, even mockery? and insinuations against him and say, woe to him who increases what is not his. For how long? Adonai. These people are lying, Lord. They come in and they steal. And they say it's theirs, then it's not theirs. It's mine. I was invited to teach in Zimbabwe in 2001. And at that time, the president of Zimbabwe had seized properties from people. And my husband and I happened to be with a very prominent person in Zimbabwe. And the president's wife had intruded into their home and said, get out of this house. This is my living room. And they had just gone through the shock of being exploited by the leaders of the government of their country who's supposed to be protecting them. And here they are getting looted. They're just so shocked. And look at this. Woe to him who increases what is not his. That's what was happening in Zimbabwe, and that's what's happening in Israel. When you increase what's not his, that means you're stealing. And Habakkuk is bothered by going, Adana, how long is this looting, this stealing, this thuggery of seizures, absconding things that they're not supposed to have, how long is this going to go on? Okay, another vocabulary word is reprove. Now, you'll see this in chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk says, I'm going to stand in my guard post. I'll station myself on the rampart, and I'm going to watch to see what God will speak to me. I've registered my complaint. And now I'm going to stand. Remember this? He's going to take his stand. He's going to watch. He's going to go, I'm going to watch and see what God's going to speak to me. And I'm just wait to see how I get reproved. And I want you to know what reproved means, okay? And being a seminary proper years, I found that most of the senior pastors don't know what reproved means. Reproved means to expose. I'm going to get exposed. God's going to speak to me and I will be the one exposed. And it says even like when he exposes the evil ones, remember he just exposes them, he just slice you open and expose your guts. 
God can expose all of you. And you're like, you're before him going, you are the just one and I am not just. And behold, you're the proud one. Your soul is not right within you. God can expose that you've got scoliosis of soul. He can expose inside your whole self. He can expose your attitude. He can expose exactly what you did. He's God. He knows. And this book is teaching us the fear of God and going, God is perfectly just. And when we come to him going, look at what happened to me. Look at what they're doing. God going, I know what they did and I'm going to address it. And I also want you to get things right. And you got to trust me because I'm making everything right and I'm in charge of it all. And I totally agree that it's wrong and I have a plan and it's so fantastic. You wouldn't even believe it if I told you. This is the book of Habakkuk. Now, let's look in chapter 2, verse 16, because there's another word I want you to see, and that is the word cup. And I've done a whole study about this. If we study the word cup, C-U-P, English, C-U-P, cup, like you drink out of a cup. If you read throughout the Old Testament, particularly like in the books of Jeremiah and in these prophetic books, and you see it here in Habakkuk, the cup is the cup of God's wrath. It's a cup of God's wrath. There's no more fearsome cup than the cup of God's wrath. And, of course, Jesus said, dear Lord, on the night before he died, oh, Lord, if there's any way this cup would pass over me, he's saying the cup of God's wrath. Now, just a little, this little footnote. When I get to lead people through communion, sometimes I'll tell them, you know, we're drinking the cup of Jesus' spilled blood. Think about it. Jesus is drinking a cup of God's wrath. So that we can drink a cup of life and forgiveness, a cup of a new covenant. And here in Habakkuk, we're learning about this cup of God's wrath. If you think Habakkuk doesn't like this injustice that's happening by the Chaldeans, oh, that is nothing. God is exponentially, we could even say infinitely more offended because God himself is infinite. God infinitely loves us. He infinitely has wrath against evil. He is infinitely perfect. He is God. Now, let's look here. Letter G, the profile of this rogue authority of the Chaldeans. Another thing you see in the book of Habakkuk is woe, 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 woe. And woe kind of means like, man, uh uh-oh for you. Woe means this is not good. Woe means this is something sorrowful. There's something wrong. There's an indictment. And it's the same word that Jesus says to the Pharisees when he's saying, woe to you, and how you're proselytizing people into this false religiosity, and you're like dead men's bones. And it's this woe. Let's look at it. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 6, where he says, woe to him who increases what is not his. Woe to you. Verse 9. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. We see this in our government leaders going, wow, a lot of people, they're exposed. And when I mean exposed, I'm not talking about reproof. I'm talking about people being exposed to poverty, to the weather, the people not having safety. And the government leaders going, oh, well, you know what? We're going to defund the police, but we're going to live in this safe, gated place, and we're going to live on a high, lofty nest, and you're going to be down here where the danger is, and we're not. So there's going to be a hypocrisy, and you can see it happening in other nations. It's not just America. It just happens with corrupt leadership, corrupt government officials, and that's what's happening here. And with the justice theme and the whoa, 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 going, you don't want to be somebody who leaves the sheep to the wolves, you lead them to the elements, and you yourself are protected hypocritically, self-prioritizing, woe to you. Verse 12, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. When you just come in and kill people and you steal out the gold and the silver from their teeth, you're stealing from their homes, you're stealing their vehicles, their horses, it's not yours. Woe to him, it says. This is the God of justice. Verse 15, chapter 2. Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk so as to look at their nakedness. You're getting them drunk so you can exploit them. You see, there's lots of sexual sin when this happens. You're getting it to where their defenses are down. And it's not just, it's not just booze. It, it turns out to be poison, doesn't it? 
and it's harming people inside and out. Verse 19, woe to him who says to a piece of wood, awake, what is this, a piece of wood? You're acting like a piece of wood is God? You're going to say awake to a piece of wood? Are you so senseless? Do you have no rationality? You have no logic? Why would you worship a piece of wood? Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, awake to a dumb stone, like a little statue, arise. Now think about the whole theme of movement. A, a, a piece of stone cannot arise. It's just a rock. It's just inanimate. And he says, and that is your teacher? Behold. Oh, there's another seeing word. Every time you see the word behold, it's a seeing word. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there's no breath inside of it. Now think about the, the theme of moving. When you breathe, there's movement. You can see inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. With wood, there's no movement. There's no inhale. There's no exhale. When it says awake, it'd be like the eyes opening. The eyes don't open. A, there's no eyes. B, they don't open. C, they don't blink. D, they don't work. It's a piece of wood. Woe to you who's doing idolatry like that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Habakkuk's prayer, chapter three, verse two. Oh, Lord. Look at this. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shiggy Annault. This is a highly emotional, poetic prayer. And he's saying, oh, Lord. I have heard the report about you, and I fear, and this is the right thing to do. It's a fear of reverence, of, Lord, I'm starting to get a notion of your godness. I came into this prayer clamoring loudly, kind of yelling at you, kind of scolding you, God, telling you you weren't being a good God, and now I'm like, oh, I've heard. I stationed myself in chapter 2, verse 1, and I watched to see how you would reply to me, what you'd speak to me, and how you're going to reprove me, expose me, and go, oh, I'm getting exposed here, and now I fear you. Chapter 3, this is his prayer. Oh, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Lord, in the cup of your wrath, remember the wrath the cup? In wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk's prayer is, Right there on your sheet, oh, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. That's something we could pray to God now, isn't it? Dear Lord, in the wrath of we've sown a lot of bad seed. Our country is not innocent. Individuals are not innocent. Christian officials are not innocent. I'm not innocent. And it's a time of indictment. Oh, God, in wrath, your justice your perfect holy wrath, your wrath, which is an aspect of your love. In my dissertation, Godly Anger, I believe that God's anger, God's wrath, is the guardian of God's love. I believe righteous anger is the guardian of love. It's God's wrath stopping the evil. And he's saying, in wrath, Lord, have mercy. Don't just, please don't steamroll us all. And let's go to your worksheet, chapter, page two, letter I, a pronouncement of God's triumph. And now you see this in chapter two, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. I don't see that at this moment, that the earth is just filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, but that's going to happen. And faithful God, who doesn't lie, says it's going to happen. You see in Habakkuk chapter two, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. In other words, hush our complaints because God is so perfect and good. And he has such a fantastic plan that's better than anything we would ever think of. That the right thing to do is for everyone to be before him in silence. And now at back at three. His splendor covers the heavens. The earth is full of his praise, and there's the hiding of his power. His ways are everlasting. See, since God's power is hidden, people think, I've got power. And the Chaldeans rush in and go, I'm the one who's got power, and I've got my house built high on a nest, and I can overtake, and no one's going to hold me accountable, and I can treat all these people, the masses of people, like fish of the sea. And I'm just going to put them on my hook, and I'm just going to devour them. And God's ways are higher. 
his power for the moment seems at end. And people underestimate, but when God's power comes, the mountains quake. Hey, listen, the mountains don't quake when the Chaldeans come. They're not collapsing. Only it's in the presence of the Lord. There's never been a human being who has all nature tremble at that person. But that's what happens with God. Habakkuk chapter 3, before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. Did the Lord rage or was your wrath against the sea so that you did trample? Now look at what he's trampling for. I've already said it, but you see it again here in Habakkuk 3. God's trampling, God's, like it seems like all this drama of the quaking mountains, it's all for salvation. So what God is saying is this, he's got a vision. And now we can see really what this is all going to be foreshadowing is the coming of Christ. You see Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, and the righteous will live by faith. The Apostle Paul quotes that in Romans chapter 1. It's all part of the gospel, that we're going to have faith in the Lord who comes and saves us. Now, this is all pretty subtle in the book of Habakkuk. But now let's look through the very end here of Habakkuk's resolve. In chapter 3, verse 16, we looked at this before, but let's look at all the way to the very end. So here's Habakkuk, and he says, okay, I heard. I heard God's answer, and God's saying, look, I'm coming in, I'm marching in, I'm sweeping in. I got my horses surfing the sea. I've got my horses in the sky. I'm coming in for salvation. The mountains are quaking at me. I see what those Chaldeans are doing. And then Habakkuk goes, okay, I get it. And God tells us already in chapters one and two, right? Especially he says in chapter one, he says, I'm coming in. I'm going to correct Israel. I'm going to correct the sin of Israel with the sin of the Chaldeans. That diamond's going to cut a diamond. That fire is going to put out the fire. This is what I'm doing. And Habakkuk goes, okay, I heard. And my inward parts trembled. The sound, my lips quivered, right? Like I'm, uh, 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 I'm not the innocent one. I'm at the foot of my parents' bed going, okay, I'm guilty too, and I'm going to confess up. Decay enters my bones. Isn't that interesting? Used to it was my soul wasn't right within me because of my pride. And now decay is entering my bones. Decay is death, isn't it? Decay enters my bones. And in my place, I tremble. In my place, I tremble. God's got his place and I got my place and I'm trembling because I must. I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Instead of me complaining, saying, Lord, how long do I have to look at all this wickedness? Look at these people. They're coming in and they're running roughshod over everybody and going, oh, God's using them to run roughshod over us. It's God's plan. God's behind it. God's the one who's raising them up to run roughshod over us because of our sin. We're getting corrected by them. Now, it's going to be swift. It won't last forever. They're going to swoosh in and they're going to pass through. But God is the one doing it. And I have to wait quietly. And my, my lips are quivering and my inward parts are, are, are shaking because I got to wait for the people to arise who will invade us. Because when I'm waiting on the people, what I'm really waiting on is God. I'm going to wait on these people to invade us because I'm waiting on God because I'm waiting on the vision that sovereign God has that moving vision hastening toward the goal. That something so great, we'd never even believe it. And of course, we know the thing that we never would even believe is that God himself is going to become human. The incarnate God, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that God's going to take all the iniquity of all, and he's going to lay it all on himself, on his son, on God himself. And Jesus is going to die for us and take away all this iniquity. That's what this is headed for. It doesn't say it explicitly. It's headed toward a gospel message. I'm not making it up because you see Habakkuk 2.4 quoted in Romans chapter 1. Verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. 
and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. My favorite book outside of scripture is a little book by Hannah Hernard, and it's called Hind's Feet on High Places. I read it decades ago. I just cried all through reading it. It's a little allegory, and the protagonist of the story, her name is Much Afraid, and Much Afraid is so scared, and Much Afraid gets this visitation from the shepherd that she's got to go up the mountain. She's got to hold hands with suffering and got to hold hands with sorrow. Those are her companions. <laughs> She goes up this hill. She runs into this other metaphorical, allegorical character called acceptance with joy. And in a way, Habakkuk is going, okay, I'm going to accept this with joy, that we're going to have a really hard time of this blustering rampage of Chaldeans. And when they come in and they rampage it, isn't it interesting how the tree doesn't give any fruit? You can see it in California. Like, why is, it, why is California on fire? The policies end up impacting the land. You can send your way into a famine. You can send your way into making the land a desert. When Israel came back and got their land, you know, it was just all a desert. They planted seeds. They turned it into a garden. Isn't that fascinating? That creation itself, the land will adjust to the hearts of the people. And now here it is at the back. There's no cattle in the stall. The flock is cut off from the fold. Yet... Habakkuk, who's waiting on God, is exulting in the Lord with faith, the unseen, convincement that there will be a time the appointed vision will not fail, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. This is a book about faith. It's a song of faith, an oracle of truth. It's a conversation with God, and it's a conversation we have with God now. Can I read this book in 13 minutes? Everybody got it open? You know, I've got a New American Standard. What book do you have? Let's see if we can read this and understand it. The book of Habakkuk, chapter 1. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. How long, O Lord, will I cry for help? And thou wilt not hear, I cry out to thee, violence, yet thou dost not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you cause me to look on iniquity? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted and God says in verse 5 look among the nations observe be astonished wonder because I God am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told for behold I God am raising up the Chaldeans that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs they are dreaded and feared their justice their authority originates with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly down like an eagle, swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces moves forward. They collect captives like the sea. They mock at kings and rulers are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress. They heap up rubble to capture it. Then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty. They whose strength is their God. And Habakkuk says, art thou Lord? Not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One. We won't die. Thou, O Lord, you've appointed them to judge. O thou, O rock, you've established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. And you can't look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look on them with favor? On those who deal treacherously. Why are you silent when the wicked swallowed up those more righteous than they? Why have you made people like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them. The Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook. They drag them out with their net. 
They gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore, they rejoice and they're glad. Therefore, those Chaldeans, they offer a sacrifice to their net. And they burn incense to their, to their fishing net. Because through these things, their catch is large. And their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? And here's a backup. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he, God, will speak to me and how I may reply when I am exposed, when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on the tablets that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it will certainly come. It will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man so that he doesn't stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like hell, like Sha'ol, and he is like death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all nations. He collects to himself all peoples. Will not all of these take up a taunt song against him? Even mockery and insinuations against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. For how long, Adonai, and makes himself rich without loans? Will not your creditors rise up suddenly and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them because you've looted many nations. All the remainder of the peoples will loot you because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all its inhabitants. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples. So you are sinning against yourself. Surely the stone will cry out from the wall and the rafter will answer it from the framework. Woe to him who builds a city without, with bloodshed. And founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts? Yahweh saw the oath. The peoples toil for fire. And nations grow weary for nothing. But the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. Woe to you who make your neighbors drink. Who mix in your venom even to make them drunk. So as to look on their nakedness. <clears throat> You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup, the cup in the Lord's right hand, will come around to you. And utter disgrace will come upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. And the devastation of its beast by which you terrified them because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants... What prophet is the idol when its maker has carved it? Or an image, a teacher of falsehood. For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, awake to a dumb stone, arise, and that is your teacher? Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver, and there's no breath in it at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigianoth. Lord, I've seen the report about you, and I fear. Oh, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God comes from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. 
His radiance is like the sunlight he has raised flashing from his hand, and there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw, I saw the tents of Kishon under distress. The tents, curtains under the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was thine anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you did ride on horses? On the chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn. You did cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. The sun and moon stood in their place. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation, you, God, did march through the earth. In anger, you did trample the nations. You did go forth for the salvation of the people, of thy people, for the salvation of thine anointed. You did strike the head of the house of evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. You did pierce with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed into scatterous. Their exultation was like those who devoured the oppressed in secret. Thou didst tread on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. Habakkuk says, I heard, and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, because I'm in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, and Though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle on the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet, and makes me walk on my high places. The book of Habakkuk is a book about turning away from idolatry. It's a book about the treachery that comes when a nation is idolatrous, when you trust in the work of your own hands, when you bow down to your nets, to your stock market, to your own business model. You think that your own idols are going to save you, and you're stealing from people and looting. You're proud. You're not sorry. And then God's going to sweep in and bring the judgment to correct Israel. And in bringing in the judgment, God brings in God's self. And with God's self, God swoops in with salvation. And Habakkuk hears this. And as the mountains quake, so Habakkuk quakes. And even though there's a time of want and deprivation, the God is his strength. And God makes his feet like hind's feet, like a deer, and he can climb up the mountain. He can hold hands with suffering and sorrow until he meets acceptance with joy and know that at one point the appointed time will come and all the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God bless you.